Welcome to tonight's MIT Enterprise Forum, and thank you for joining us for this evening. My name is Sam Sarmat, and I'm the chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Northwest Chapter. Uh, we are an all-volunteer nonprofit organization, um, part of the network of 28 worldwide chapters for the MIT Enterprise Forum, based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, we are managed by MIT <coughs> Technology Review, which is an independent magazine owned by MIT, um, with a global readership of uh, 4.5 million people. Our mission is to inspire, connect, and educate our region's entrepreneurs and the technology business community. Um, first, I'd like to take a poll here. How many people, uh, uh, is, is it your first time attending one of our events? Could you raise your hands, please? Wow. Quite a few people. Okay. Thank you. You better be good up here. <laughs> yeah. We're always good. So. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be calling tonight's uh, event planning team. And if you're going to applause, please wait uh, until everybody has uh, stood up. Uh, the team was led by Jimmy Gia. Um, he dedicated a lot of time in a uh, um, in an actually short amount of time that we had to, to put the event together. And uh, please join me in ta thanking them. Jimmy? Jimmy's back there. He's also the vice chair of the organization. Um, Ken Appel. Ken's back there. Thanks. <laughs> Budi uh, Junaidi. I don't think Budi's here. Uh, Doug Gellert, uh, Nadine, uh, Nadine uh, Kripitz, I know she's here. Uh, Ashley Long, Shirley Lundy, she's not. Alex Modelski, uh, Nat. <laughs> Seymour <laughs> and Jamie Wigand. Yeah. Uh, also, like to recognize many volunteers in our organization who work really hard behind the scenes uh, to make these events possible. Also, our wonderful sponsors, including Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who is our event sponsor tonight. Frommer, Lawrence, and Hogg, which is a premier sponsor uh, for MIT Enterprise Forum. Uh, Stoll Reeves, Point B, Summit Law Group, Kibble and Prentice, and R2 Integrated, which is our chapter's digital marketing agency and a sponsor who manages all of our social media needs. Um, finally, I'd like to draw your attention to page five of your program handouts for our 2013 upcoming events. Um, I hope you can join us for the events. Uh, on December 5th, we have our Northwest uh, Startup Demo, which is a must-see to, um, to come and check out the latest Northwest technology companies who want to showcase their products. Uh, we also have a January 10th um, VLAB event, which is uh, about crowdsourcing. A January 16th MIT Enterprise Forum uh, event on big data. And our January 28th Mix and Mingle which is uh, a networking event. Um, tonight, we invite you to tweet and participate in tonight's program. Uh, our Twitter handle is uh, MIT Forum, and the hashtag that we use is also MIT Forum for tonight. Um, you can also follow us on that uh, Twitter handle. And without further ado, uh, join me in welcoming our events uh, moderator, the industry veteran, and Principal of Intrin Intrinsic Strategy and GeekWire columnist, Frank Catalano. Thank you, Sam. It's always interesting seeing who gets applause and the volunteers and if they're here or not. It's not as though they're, if they're not here, they're not worthy of applause. I would be very clear about that. They just can't appreciate it as much as if they were here. Welcome to Obstacles and Opportunities for Entrepreneurs in Education. I want to start by asking how many of you actually are in education, either in, in the business or as an educator, or I know we have at least one 11th grade student in the audience. 
I'm not kidding. We actually do. Good. Okay. How many of you are um, uh, entrepreneurs in technology in general or work in technology? Okay. Uh, how many of you are wandered into the wrong session? <laughs> just want to, okay, let's just make that clear. Somebody does actually did raise their hand. All right. So in the next 90 minutes, we'll explore the entrepreneurial landscape in education with a focus on K-12 because that is the form of education that is mandatory in the U.S. and it does tie into higher education in other areas. We will touch on these other markets, though there are significant differences, and this is important, in who the customers and purchasers are, where the money comes from, even the purchase cycle. There are these other markets, by the way, higher ed I talked about, continuing in professional education, adult and lifelong learning, and then the ever-elusive, yet so attractive, direct-to-parent market. <laughs> and since this is an MIT Enterprise Forum, our lens is how technology is being applied to education, what that means in terms of opportunities, obstacles, and general lay of the land. Now, I'm Frank Catalano, as Sam mentioned, your moderator for tonight. My job is to keep the panel on topic and on time, and I'll be an active moderator in that role. Now, unlike an MIT Enterprise Forum that I moderated, as someone remembered, nearly two years ago, I am a pseudo-expert on this topic. <laughs> and I have been in personal technology a long time as well. I currently run Intrinsic Strategy, and I work with education, technology, and digital learning firms. I'm an analyst for the EdNet Insight Market Research Service, which is focused on education. And I write regularly for the NPR and KQED education website MindShift, the EdTech news site EdSurge, and I'm a founding columnist for GeekWire where I don't write about education at all, except for the rather incendiary post I did a week and a half ago. That's still getting me in trouble. So this is not gonna be your traditional MIT Enterprise Forum where we have a presenting company. What we're gonna basically do is have an entirely, and you can hold your applause, PowerPoint-free discussion. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We're gonna start with an opening question for each panelist to set the stage. Then we're gonna get deep into discussion with our panelists about who all represent, and by the way, some more than one, the teacher, entrepreneur, and established company perspectives. And you will be involved in a Q&A as we go. It's not gonna be all held to the end. So if there's something that you think is really interesting, please raise your hand. I'd rather have you do that than walk out bored. Now, before we get underway, I wanna give you some context. And this will be a, just a something I really hadn't planned on doing, but it turns out that those of us who are in this area have so many baseline assumptions about what people may or may not know that I wanted to outline what I think are five important trends that I think are, will help sort of undergird some of our discussion today. How important each of these is will, of course, vary based on the panelist. The first trend is Common Core state standards. How many of you have heard of the Common Core? Are you all of you the educators, or are some of you non-educators? All right, anyway. So up until recently, every state had its own learning standards in a number of different areas, math and English language arts primarily. This basically meant about 50 different markets in the US for textbooks, tests, and other materials. Now recently, a group of states all agreed on common standards in math and English language arts. Now, 45 and a half states have agreed to it. Minnesota has only adopted one of the two sets. And, um, and they're doing this for teaching, and nearly that many have adopted them for their tests that they give students as well. Now this creates a more consistent, but not necessarily more level playing field, because theoretically there are fewer bits of customization that have to be done in what's out there. So that's the first trend, Common Core. Second trend is one-to-one -one computing. This is not a new trend. Uh, Maine actually started their first one-to-one -one computing initiative 10 years ago. And it's expanded now when we talk about one-to-one -one computing to include tablets, to include stuff called bring your own technology. The intent of all these is, is all the same. Give every student a digital device from which they can learn. That is the intent of all these initiatives. And the point of this is that since the world, in the real world is increasingly digital, it's important for students' education to reflect that in a way. Now, if this happens, theoretically, schools and districts would supply them. However, due to budget cuts, due to the consumerization of what's happening in education and technology, you have this trend now toward calling bring your own device or bring your own technology, which is very, very nascent. It's not out there very much right now yet. But in this trend, students are encouraged to bring certain computing devices from home to use on the school network. So you'll hear a bit about that as well. We're still far from true one-to-one -one computing, though, even if that's the case. So that's the second trend. The third is this thing 
which sounds like the world's worst bureaucratic term, but it's Open Educational Resources, or OER, not to be confused with an instrumental band of a decade ago. Now, because more, that's orchestral maneuvers in the dark, by the way, OMD, for those who don't remember. All right, so I'm old. More instructional material now is available in discrete digital chunks. That's what's driving OER. In other words, everything from lessons to activities to lesson plans to units, all of these are available digitally in chunks. And they're being created not just by companies, but also by teachers and students and lots of other interested parties. So that's what people to drive this concept of mixing, modifying, and sharing instructional resources. That is the open and open educational resource. These are digital chunky resources kind of like peanut butter, that can be mixed, modified, and shared. The U.S. Department of Education's gotten behind this, several nonprofit foundations have, but if you hear the term open education resources or OER, that's the third trend we're talking about. Fourth trend is one that I think is near and dear to at least two, maybe all three hearts on this panel, four hearts, is adaptive and personalized learning. This is when teaching changes based on how a student reacts and interacts. Now, that's been happening for hundreds of years. Teachers personalize, good teachers personalize. They don't require technology to do that. But if you add technology to the mix or put it online, it makes it easier to adapt or personalize the instruction quickly. So most often, people think about adaptive software as did the student answer this question right or wrong and then they get to go on to the next question or they have to jump back and, and relearn something. But increasingly, that's a really blunt-edged instrument to talk about adaptive software and personalization. Increasingly now, personalization is not just based on what a student clearly understands or doesn't understand, but how much time do they take in a certain area before doing the next thing? What other things do they click on while they're trying to figure out what's going on? So even what can even now get to a point where you're tracking if a student is starting to respond similar to how other students have progressed, showing the same pattern as other students, the software can adapt and change its approach to mimic what successful students with similar patterns have shown. This actually is where big data meets adaptive instruction and can be very, very interesting. And this is your fourth trend. Fifth trend, foundations and reform organizations. And I say this with all the kindness I can possibly muster to one of our main sponsors tonight, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They've been actually in this a lot. They've actually admitted publicly areas where they've failed, which it takes a lot of doing and a lot of guts. But this is external to the classroom. It's nonprofit foundations, education reform organizations, all pushing for change in education, notably K-12. Now, the drivers that for their doing this can be different. They might be perceptions that kids are falling behind globally in their relative performance in school. It could be rising college tuitions and higher ed. And some of these organizations use technology and grants as a lever. Others use policy and politics as a lever. But this is a trend in education, whether those in education want it or not. So to recap the five, common core standards to create consistent math and English language arts, arts learning standards across most states in K-12, one-to-one computing or bring your own technology to get every student a digital device, open education resources for chunks of digital classroom content that can be mixed, modified, and shared, and much of it's free. Adaptive and personalized learning using tech and data to help a student progress. And foundations and reform organizations applying external pressure and resources in a bid to improve K-12 overall. There are more things online, blended learning and all that, but these are five key things. I'm sure we'll get into a lot more. So with that as, did I lose anybody, by the way, completely? Yet? Okay. Our three panelists uh, on my extreme left starting over there. Lindsay Ohn, middle school science and health teacher in the greater Seattle area at the Evergreen School. You can find, by the way, all the bios in your program that you have there. She's also a tech evangelist in education and was one of the main organizers of the recent Startup Weekend Seattle EDU. Her students use digital data collection probes, Skype, computer games, and all manner of interesting little devices. Jesse Willie Wilson is chair, president, and CEO of Dreambox Learning. Dreambox is still a relatively new company, and it's a pioneer in adaptive learning with its intelligent adaptive learning platform that currently is at the heart of its online elementary math program. Jesse has also held leadership roles at Blackboard and Leapfrog Schoolhouse, which is where I think you and I met. And Randy Reina is Senior Vice President of Digital Product Development at McGraw-Hill Education's Center for Digital Innovation. 
McGraw-Hill is one of the big three companies in education, com commonly thought of that way. Randy's group has built web-based instructional and assessment apps for a decade and supports more than five million users. He's a former teacher and administrator as well. And I should point out, uh, the Center for Digital Innovation and Dreambox are both based here in the Seattle area. And a lot of people don't necessarily know that. So let's start off with an opening question for each of the three of you. The question is, what's the biggest misconception the general public and entrepreneurs have about the role of technology in education today? What is that big misconception? Jesse, do you want to go first? I'm trying to figure out what I... <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what I would say is the, the biggest, but I think one is that uh, you can overlay technology on whatever is happening in education and you will see improvement. I would caution you, te techno technology is not a panacea, and to the extent that technology can enhance instructional outcomes, it can be great, but um, I think sometimes entrepreneurs get into this and they don't realize, they think about their there are competitors with, at different companies, or they might even think about competition for funding, federal funding or local funding, but they oftentimes underestimate the competition for time. Teachers just don't have that much time. And so the solutions have to be easy to implement. They have to make the teacher feel inspired, not rather than stupid. Um, and they have to be designed, I believe, to forward student progress. And so I, th I think we, there's a lot of irrational exuberance about technology for technology's sake. But uh, one, one thing I might encourage is for you to really understand the nature of teaching and understand how very little time a teacher has to incorporate your special widget that you think is going to revolutionize everything. Um, they just don't have that much time. So the two misconceptions then are how much time a teacher has to apply to anything new. And I've occasionally mentioned that I, I do have a, a former wife who is now a second grade teacher, which should tell me something, but I consider her my hostile focus group of one. And um, she has honestly told me that if she can't learn something in two to five minutes, she's never going to use it again. So that's good. So one is the, this time, and the second one basically is that just layering tech on top of stuff doesn't necessarily make it better. Yes, you made reference to the one-to-one -one initiative yeah. many, many years ago in Maine. And we used to define success as putting a device in front of a kid. And if we got every kid to have a device, then we should consider ourselves successful. And yet, when you take a look at the impact it had on student progression, we were all very disappointed. And so I think we're at a, a point in history where we can move beyond just technology for technology's sake and actually think of a more seamless integration of technology so that it can impact learning precisely at the point of instruction. Lindsay, you're a teacher, you're a tech enthusiast, you're involved in the startup community. What do you think is the biggest misconception? Um, I think it's really hard to narrow down to just one, for sure. Um, but I think uh, probably one of the biggest misconceptions and one of the biggest mistakes that I see a lot of groups making is they've got this great idea and this awesome product that they want to create to help teachers. And maybe it's something that really can help teachers, but they wait until they've already got their beta to start getting teacher input. Um, and because you know, teachers are the ones in the classrooms, we're the ones who are gonna be using it, we're the ones who really deeply understand the pedagogy of what we're trying to accomplish in the classrooms. There need to be teachers involved from day one. I'm gonna stop you for one second. Can you define for the technology people in the room what pedagogy is? Pedagogy. Um, so, uh, who are my other teachers in the audience again? <laughs> Oh, hey, wait, there were hands earlier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no one's messing up now. Um, so uh, pedagogy is the, um, the process or the concepts that you're using to build your curriculum. Um, so pedagogy is uh, your mindset when you're designing a learning experience for kids. So uh, Socratic dialogue is one type of pedagogy where you're asking kids questions to elicit learning and understanding, and project-based learning is another type of pedagogy where you're having kids apply knowledge in meaningful ways. And then and then lecture is another type of pedagogy where folks are standing up at the front of the room delivering content. Um, and so, does that make sense what pedagogy is? 
I ask my seventh graders that 10 million times a day. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So. Okay, great. So, uh, so please continue. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the biggest mis misconception that I really see is that you can come up with a sweet widget. It might be great, but it really has to be rooted in what is going to be happening in the classroom, in the pedagogy, in the learning objectives. And it, it might be really pretty and shiny, but if it doesn't have that perspective of what how is this going to support learning objectives in the classroom? Like, not just that it's cool, but that it's going to support learning in this specific way. Um, and kind of from that, I was hoping I could throw in another trend to your list of five, and that's 21st century skills. Um, so a long time, alongside the common core standards of you know the the English and the math, and and we're working on science and history as well. There's also the 21st century um, learning skills, which are communication and finding systems and patterns, and and innovation is one of the 21st century skills. And um, so incorporating those 21st century skills into everything that we do in schools and in classrooms. Is, um, is something that can really be supported by technology as well. Okay, great. Randy, what about you? What do you see as the biggest misconception frequently made? Uh, first of all, I agree with, I'll, I'll get used to this. First of all, I agree with uh, what was said before, but um, I'll take it from a, a little different angle and talk about a systemic change in education. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that um, when entrepreneurs come in with a great new idea, they don't necessarily think about the ripple effect that that uh, idea may or may not have with the rest of the organization. And um, education um, is a, a complicated system in many ways. It's a political system. And um, because of that, the change process that occurs change, changes slowly. Um, I'm sure many people are familiar with the work that um, uh, Christensen's done on disruptive, uh, disrupting different industries, and he did his work on the disk drives because the disruption occurred very quickly. Um, he also did some work on uh, front end loaders, and the disruption did occur, but it occurred over, I believe, 25 years. I would say that education is more towards that side of the continuum than on the disk drive side of the continuum. What is inside the loader in education? What is inside the loader? <laughs> I'm not sure I'll take that analogy that far. Um, but, but I do think that we, in education now, is a very, very important time. It's a very exciting time. I think we are at a tipping point. I think we have a number of very uh, real um, uh, structural changes that are going on in the industry that we can talk about. Um, but that tipping point is going to tip slowly because of the kinds of things that you guys talked about before um, and also just behind, because of the, the change process that occurs um, within classrooms, within buildings, within districts, and across states. So we have change occurring. We have everybody pretty much agreeing on the fact that You've got to make this easy for teachers if you're an entrepreneur and useful for teachers. And you have to understand what a teacher's day is like in order to do that. Uh, and that basically um, putting technology on top of an existing process, if it's a bad process, doesn't make that process automatically better. Or even if it's a good process, doesn't make that process better because it take, could take time. Yet what we're seeing also from the outside of education is one of the trends I alluded to earlier, which are the foundations that are involved, uh, a lot of the nonprofits out there, uh, the, um, you have groups, uh, Gates Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, Carnegie Corporation, you have uh, Creative Commons getting involved in this area in education with open educational resources, you have politically oriented groups, uh, several of which are out there now, Jeb Bush, Bob Wise, various levels of politics, how are these influencing education technologies uptake? And can you have education reform without education technology or vice versa? Who wants to tackle that first? That was two really different questions. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's, which one would you like to tackle? So you, I, I heard the how are foundations impacting um, educational technology uptake, and then also the question of 
education reform versus education technology. Because also education reform can take place without foundations and stuff as well. So I think they're kind of three separate things and kind of looking at all three of them. So let's go ahead and talk about ed tech versus ed reform first and then the various influencing factors. Can you have in the current environment education reform without technology? Yes. How? <laughs> I mean, we've had education reform for a very long time without technology, and technology is incredibly supportive of it, of education reform. Um, some of the, the new, I mean, I say new, but project-based learning's been around for a very long time, but it's still newer than, like, Socratic method and lecture, which has been sort of the tradition, what is thought of as traditional education models. And um, project-based learning has, it, it it can be totally successful without laptops in every classroom. When I taught in Chicago, I didn't have laptops for every kid, but I was able to do really cool projects with my students. And so if if teachers understand sort of new emerging pedagogies and they, they can bring those to their students to develop deeper understanding, we don't need a computer to do that. Computers and, and programs can make it much easier. There's wonderful tools that help my kids analyze data in more meaningful ways, that help them present and global, collaborative, blah, blah, blah. You guys know all the terms. But it's, um, it's not necessary by any means, but it does help a lot. Jesse, any thoughts? So. I think that the complement of technology combined with what with successful schooling models has a promise of scaling and scalability that without technology wouldn't be possible. So if if we had a world where every child had a great teacher like you, you know, maybe we wouldn't have a lot of technological innovation. Um, I think that technology is is used imagine the best teacher possible, or everybody can remember the, the great teacher that they had when they were in elementary or middle school. Remember that teacher right now. Conjure that image. If we could get that teacher in front of every kid, it would be fabulous. But most kids don't have access to those teachers. And so imagine that best teacher that you've already experienced with limitless patience, unlimited data, and 24-7 access to every one of her students. That's the promise of technology. So technology can help scale greatness. Uh, the underbelly is that it can help scale bad things, too, getting back to my previous comments. But I, I believe that the future of learning is going to be a blended uh, model that is going to create um, a lot more affordable, scalable options for kids that are going to make it so that it doesn't matter what language you speak or it doesn't matter what zip code that you happen to be randomly born in. But whatever, it doesn't even matter what your starting point is because of adaptive uh, technologies, that your learning potential and therefore your human potential can be realized. Thoughts, Randy, on uh, education reform versus and or with education technology? Um, well, first of all, I, I, don't think that, um, I don't think that the technology as an instructional uh, application was going to replace the teacher. I think it can support the teacher. Um, and I think in certain situations uh, with certain kids, it can uh, do a lot of the work, um, especially um, if a kid is uh, a couple of years behind and needs to needs to catch up. Um, but the teacher is there to inspire kids and to um, help kids work together and do a lot of things that the technology can't do. I do think that we're getting into a situation now in education where data is becoming much more important. And there's a variety of different types of data that we have to start looking at that can help us inform decisions about kids and can help teachers inform decisions about kids. And I think that without the technology, that data analysis wouldn't be possible. So to unpack the question, Again, Lindsay, to your point here, how does the influence then of uh, a number of these organizations in this area, foundations and reform organizations, affect the entrepreneurial landscape? Do they distort it? Are they helpful to it? Jesse? So I actually am very hopeful about what um, foundations can do to de-risk decisions for educational leaders. So one of the challenges entrepreneurs have is trying to convince outstanding educators that their box is worthy of their attention. And so if you have a great teacher and they're having great results, 
there's really little incentive for her to try your new box because she's got, for every one of you that year, she's got 15 others coming the next year. It's just very difficult for her to metabolize all the opportunities. So what I think foundations can do is to help generate data that will help to de-risk a decision to try something new so that nothing is on the line. Your student's progression is not on the line. Your job is not on the line. So you have entities that can partner with educational, uh, with education leaders, and all kinds of learning guardians to say, here's the data that we were able to generate in a classroom setting with a profile of student that is similar to yours. Now you have data that can make you more confident that if you were to experiment with this, it's going to be a good thing. So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to, to de-risk innovation. Interesting. Randy? Yeah, I think I, I completely agree with that. I think there's ways that foundations can help to um, show the effectiveness of different types of applications. Um, there's a lot of good work going on in different foundations on uh, gamification of education, um, doing research on serious gaming and how that can motivate kids to learn. I think that's very helpful and um, it changes the conversation um, both with educators and also with parents. It helps uh, bring gaming into the uh, classroom, which is sometimes a difficult thing to do. Uh, because kids shouldn't be playing games, that kind of thing. Um, I also want to uh, suggest one other um, way that foundations and um, the sponsor of this event actually is, is making a big change in education. And, and one thing that I think the uh, entrepreneurs should pay a lot of attention to, and that's um, something that you may be talking about later, is the Shared Learning Collaborative um, that's funded by the Gates Foundation. The Shared Learning Collaborative is a way for um, uh, entrepreneurs to put their, um, inf their content and curriculum up on a site and have it tagged by, um, by uh, other um, uh, uh, districts and themselves and, and make it searchable. So it brings down the barrier to entry in the education industry. What is often difficult for an entrepreneur is to get access to the teacher and to the principal. And the, one of the aspects of the Shared Learning Collaborative is going to make that access directly to the teacher and directly to the principal uh, a lot easier for the, for the entrepreneur. Yeah, it's kind of an alphabet soup, actually. It's a learning registry, learning resource metadata initiative, and the shared learning infrastructure. There will be a quiz by the way, at the end. Uh, but I, I, if I understand what you're saying basically is what foundations can do is, and, and some of these other organizations, but perhaps foundations uniquely, is do some of the heavy lifting to prove, in Jesse's point, that something can work. So the entrepreneur doesn't have to go ahead and, and do that work independently and then have a question because it's their own work, right? And they can build infrastructure or plumbing such as the shared learning infrastructure and some of these other initiatives that entrepreneurs can then have as underpinnings under what they're doing and build applications on top of. There's one other thing if I could add, which is, uh, you know, when you think about selling something to schools and to districts, oftentimes you'll be overwhelmed perhaps by the difficulty of the distribution, right? We all know that it takes, I don't know, 12 to 18 months typically to close a deal with a, with a district. Well, if you're a scrappy entrepreneur, 18 months could be a lifetime, right? So at Dreambox, one of the things that we did was we decided to focus on teachers and principals. And so in the beginning, we de-risked it for teachers by letting them do it for free. And ultimately, they were able to generate their own data about Dreambox in their classroom, take it to their principal and say, Look at my students on Dreambox. Look what they've been able to do compared to the students I didn't have on Dreambox. And then the principal could make a building-wide decision, and ultimately a Title I coordinator, coordinator may have noticed it, and then you make a district-wide decision. So you can get to the district. And so at Dreambox, we have about a 30-day sales cycle um, for a building. And you know, at LeapFrog and at Blackboard, I was lucky. I mean, I felt very successful if it was a 12-month sales cycle. It can be very daunting. You have a lot of fixed costs that you have to incur as an, entre as an entrepreneur if you're going to have a big distribution uh, network, if you're not a big three. 
And, and that, you could have the best box in the world and you still won't win. That's one of the things that has plagued K through 12 is that the best box didn't win because it was about distribution hegemony. And one of the things that's very encouraging, I think, about this time that Frank is talking about that we're in is that there, is a lot, there are a lot of innovative teachers who are willing to take a look at things and you just have to get your box to them. So you don't, I don't have, I mean, we sell Dreambox over the phone. We do webinars and we leverage social media, you know, and we have a 30 day sales cycle and we have, we have great results. We're in, we're in 50 states. And at first when I came and I, to Dreambox and I said we weren't gonna hire a lot of salespeople to go around and have cars and have a lot of collateral in their trunk that they never show district administrators because they never could get to see district administrators. <laughs> Um, it really changed the model and the economics and the requirements for success. So I would, I would encourage you to be very, very thoughtful about distribution and to be disruptive and come up with the crazy idea and, uh, and try it out. It might work. I think that's, I mean, that's exactly what you have to do. And, and with your leadership, you guys have been able to do that. Um, I think the, the shared learning collaborative, one of its main goals is to break down that, that uh, distribution uh, barricade that is often exists to try to get to those 15,000 districts in the U.S. Um, the, the search is going to be part of schema.org, so it will be part of the, um, the, the big search engines. So I think it will help uh, teachers find access to some of the um, other applications that will be out there. And actually, I wrote a piece about this. Um, it's too late for it to appear in the program where it lists various items. But if you go to edsurge.com, ed, E-D, surge.com, and just search for Catalano, it actually may still be on the home page. It's uh, called Potent Alphabet Soup, uh, it, uh, How basically what entrepreneurs have to know about learning registry, LRMI, and, and shared learning collaborative. And there's, it's actually written in English. There's one thing, too. You should, you should check out Edmodo. And, and services like that. I mean, what you guys need is exposure. And you need to have great teachers saying amazing things about you. I mean, one of the best things that we did, and I can't take credit for it because it happened before I came to Dreambox, is that we took master teachers out of the classroom. We sat them down next to software engineers, and we said partner together to build something that th these teachers, master teachers, would be proud and excited to use in their classroom. And it's amazing what happened. We created all these evangelists who saw the program, loved the program, talked about the program, touted the benefits of the program. Zero marketing dollars, folks. And we had a couple of districts before we knew it. And then we added infrastructure on top of that. Don't underestimate the leverage that you can gain from social media. Because that's something that, you know, earlier in my career, I, I didn't have access to. I did, we couldn't leverage. You guys have a lot more opportunity because of that. So check them out. And, um, and don't underestimate what, what they can do to help you defray some costs. Lindsay, uh, Jesse's talked a bit about making sure, first off, this fits into what a teacher does. You've talked about pedagogy mm -hmm. and defined it nicely. Um, how do entrepreneurs get access to teachers, especially if they're not in education or from education? I think this is actually another area where foundations can actually can be really supportive um, of the the connection between technology and education. Um, we've talked a lot about how uh, foundations can do kind of the legwork of vetting good uh, tools in the classroom, but I think. Um, Foundations can also be helpful in bedding, in vetting the um, the education side of the the tools as well. And so foundations can be supportive in connecting teachers. I mean, um, Washington STEM is uh, an organization uh, that promotes science, technology, engineering, and math education in the state. And they have connections to all these super innovative teachers. And there, there are several organizations like that. Um, and those kinds of foundations can both help bring teachers to resources, but they can also help bring um, entrepreneurs to resources as well. And so these, um, the foundations can, can help um, uh, entrepreneurs better understand what our needs are in the classroom. So, you know, not everybody's gonna be able to bring in master teachers, bring in 10 master teachers to help develop their first product. It might just be, you know, you in your office creating something cool. And so if there are more resources where um, 
uh, entrepreneurs and other types of developers can really deeply understand needs in the classroom, that would be a great thing for Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to put together, is like how, um, like what the needs really are. And there are, you know, a few bloggers who are writing great things about like needs in the classroom, but it's pretty small scale right now. And, and that's something that foundations can bring to large scale. What do we need? But let me think a bit, a bit practical here and just see what everybody's advice would be. So let's say we have an somebody who's an entrepreneur not in education, raise your hand, just anybody. Okay, great, so we have a few here. I have this idea for this cool widget, and it's a great widget. It's not like putting icing on a turd. It's a really, <laughs> really good widget, okay? That's how you reinforce bad teaching practice, by the way. Uh, and. I really would like to talk to some teachers, and I, you know, if I show up at an elementary school saying I want to show this to some teachers, they're going to assume I'm some freak and call security. Yes. Okay. So practically, what would each of you advise about finding a few teachers to take a look at your idea and test your idea on? I mean, scaling is a great idea with a foundation, but that that's a longer term piece. Mm -hmm. I'd say small local conferences. Um, that's a great place to find teachers. Twitter. Twitter. Um. The, the great uh, ed chat is a great hashtag. So is ed tech mm -hmm. on, uh, on Twitter for educators. Yeah, but, but both of those, I mean, if you want to get face to face, like there are conference, education conferences almost every week. In in you know Seattle, between Seattle and Portland, and those are great places to meet people. And you know, depending on how intense you want to get with it, if you if you know, it, some of those it costs fifty bucks to set up a vendor table. Like that's worth some startup funds. And um, and you can have people come by. And believe me, teachers will tell you all day long what they need. You get a teacher to sit down. You get me to sit down. I will tell you all day long what I need in my classroom. And any of us will. Um, and then on Twitter as well. I mean, I've seen. Um, I just got on Twitter this summer for the first time, and there's this amazing education space on Twitter of people having really deep conversations about pedagogy and about the classroom and about how to get deep learning with their kids. And um, and every once in a while, somebody pops up with a question about like, hey, what do you think about this project idea? And people respond. It's it's a great tool. I think that those are probably some of the best ideas. LinkedIn has some very good groups for education technology. Um, a lot of different types of groups, actually. So that's a good place to get started. I would also say that as soon as you can get yourself into a classroom and get trusted by um, a, a, a building a principal, get into the classroom and start working directly, because there's nothing like being in the class with 30 kids and a teacher and having them try out your, your, your software or your, or your project. It's so much fun. <laughs> All right, let me uh, take this, take a step back and talk about the market in general and some of the implications of Common Core standards, because those are across 46-ish states, math and English language arts to start, and, and uh, Lindsay, uh, you know, uh, sort of talked briefly about the next generation science standards, which are also in development and possibly some standards in history. A lot of talk, and there's been a lot of talk on the tech blogs that this is breakthrough, this creates a level playing field. You basically have now one addressable market across the US in most states, plus Texas and Alaska and Virginia. Um, is it an entrepreneurial heaven? Is it really a flat market or is it lumpy? What, what is the implication of Common Core for the entrepreneurs? Jesse? Well, I think it's good and bad, like most things in life. There's a there's kind of a heads and a tails to it. The the good is that instead of having to create a product that is going to be aligned with 50 different states, you know, the great America, right? Um, you you build one box, and if it's aligned with Common Core, you're going to have almost 50 people who will who will be in your market in your addressable market. The tails of it is that there's a big gap still between the concept and the ideal of Common Core and what's actually in practice. And if you talk to educators and administrators, they're stressed about implementing Common Core with fidelity. Um, they don't, there's not a lot of professional development. There's not a lot of guidance. And so when you're trying to make a market for your product and you want attention on the great widget, 
you're going to have people who are very, very distracted just trying to focus. This is Maslow's hierarchy, right? They're, they're focused on shelter and, and food, and, and you want them to talk about self, self-actualization. So I go in and I said, oh, I have this great intelligent adaptive learning technology. And the, you know, the eyes are like, are you serious, woman? I got to think about common core implementation. And so you really have to figure out a way to align what you're doing to demonstrate that uh, time spent with you and your product is going to be, is going to make their lives easier. So the tales of it is we're at the early part of it and adoption is still low and people are still trying to figure out Common Core. You're gonna get to a point where it's gonna be pretty well implemented and then I think it'll truly accelerate. But right now we're in kind of that middle earth where everyone's talking about Common Core. There isn't a lot of you know, good practice around it and we're gonna struggle for a couple years before we can really accelerate in my mind. So it's, it's pretty new, um, uh, and as I said before, education changes slowly. Um, I, I do think that um, the, you're exactly right that, that um, educators are trying to figure out how to implement Common Core. I think for us that provides an opportunity uh, because we did build a new math Common Core program um, and provided some professional, professional development around that and um, did very well in the market just because people were trying to figure out how to implement the new Common Core. Those standards are very different. Um, I also think that the reality is different than a lot of the hype, which is often the case. Um, And uh, by that specifically, I mean that by adopting the Common Core, the states are saying, uh, we adopt the Common Core, but we reserve 15% of our standards to be different than everything else. So yes, you adopt the Common Core, but you still have to address the extra 15% times 50. Um, so it's, it's lumpy, I would say. It's, it's helpful, it's better. We're getting, cl- we're getting more agreement on what kids are gonna need to be able to do and know across the United States. I think that's a great thing, but um, there still is some, some lumpiness around aside from the states that don't adopt it. And it's only two subjects, maybe three with science, if that goes through. And there's a lot of other stuff out there and still. And social studies is coming, but it's further behind, yeah. Does this make any difference in your classroom, Lindsay, Common Core? I mean, if, some, if an entrepreneur came and you said, I got this great Common Core thing, you could say, I'm with the Evergreen School. We do it our <laughs> way. I, I do teach in an independent school, and so we don't we don't do the state standardized tests and all that kind of thing. Um, but you know, I, I used to teach in public school, and we had state standards. But I did teach in a school. I mean, there are school districts where the teacher has to write on the board what standard they are working on that day. And there's, there's some value to that in terms of like making the learning transparent for the kids, like saying, like, OK, kids, here's the learning objective for the day. Um, and by having consistent standards across all the states, that can be a, a fabulous entrepreneurial activity if you are creating like a new static textbook. Um, but I don't think many people are doing that anymore. Um, and, and so I know, like, uh, um, and you might be able to speak to this some, Randy, because you've been with McGraw-Hill for a while, but I know the textbook companies used to write textbooks mostly for Texas and California because they were the, hu- they were the huge purchasers. And so it didn't really exactly matter what Illinois' standards were because we would either buy a Texas or a California textbook because that's where the biggest market was. So now it's, it's cool that there's one set of standards for every Everybody. Sounds like it's still also Texas. <laughs> I'm from Texas, so I can say that. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I don't really understand what all the excitement about Common Core is because it's about um, what content needs to be delivered. But I think the most exciting aspects of technology entrepreneurship are coming in how the content is delivered and, and in helping teachers develop really exciting, innovative ways to um, bring content and help kids analyze content and help kids create content. And so the, the specific standards being the same state to state I think in in your example where you're creating this adaptive learning platform, that's useful because you have a single set of standards that go from state to state. I don't think that is like all that there is to do in in technology and education. I think there's so much more besides making it all have the common core. 
So let's talk a bit about that environment in the schools when it comes to technology and what an entrepreneur or a business can expect to, to get into if they're developing something today. The, the hype is that everybody in the world has an iPad, their cats have iPads, their infants have iPads, and then their cats are on the iPads that they own. What is the reality of the technology infrastructure in a school today? If you were an, if you were an entrepreneur starting today, what baseline assumptions are safe to make about the technology in the average school or district? None. There, there, I'm sorry. There's no safe assumption that you can assume even 50% of schools have. I, I think you can assume that at least 50% of schools, the teacher has a computer. What about infra internet, though, and, and uh, other parts of the infrastructure? Yeah, that teacher computer, I think it would be safe to say that teacher computer has the internet. Um, 9600 baud modem? <laughs> Hardwired, so like, it, yeah, hardwired probably. But, 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 is, but if you were building a startup today, I mean, l let's assume that we can't make assumptions that everybody has something. What would be the minimum you would build for in a product? What would be some of the technology aspects that you would make sure are reflected? I, I have a friend who teaches in one of the smaller school districts in the Seattle area, and his school was able to cobble together three desktop computers per classroom with, um, with internet access on those computers. And through his just like wheedling and like you know constant meetings and everything, he was able to convince a bunch of teachers to put those together in, in one room so that more kids could be using it instead of just having three in the classroom with 30 kids, groups of 10 on a computer. And, um, and they were able to combine some of them so that they were able to do more. So I think, you you could you could do a baseline assumption that most schools could probably have groups of four kids working on a computer at a time. Um, you can't assume that all kids have computers at home. I teach at a, a very well endowed independent school, and we do have um, students who don't have computers at home. Um, and we, you know, if we did BYOD, b bring your own device, we would have kids who don't have devices to bring, and so we would have to provide devices for them. And, and that's at again a very well endowed school, um, and so. I, I, you can't assume really anything beyond there being a couple computers that can be used. So I think there, th th there's a lot of truth to that, but I would encourage you not to think about where the hockey puck is, but where the hockey puck is going. Because there are big plans afoot to change that mm -hmm. and to make and, and to approach this reality where you're going to have at least uh, a handful of, of computers or devices in every classroom, even if it isn't one-to-one. -one. And, and so I think you have to plan for that. The other thing I would recommend that you do is just think about the technology adoption curve. You know, you're going to have your innovators in the beginning, you're going to have the middle of the curve, and you're going to have your laggards. And, you know, think about your addressable market. So 100,000 schools, elementary schools, you know, so Dreambox doesn't go after 100,000. We took the subset of, the, of that addressable market, which is about 40,000 that are what we call Dreambox ready. You know, they have leaders that are interested in blended learning, even if they don't yet have the devices, they have the leadership that we know is going to get the devices, or they already have the technology and the band, the broadband in, in place. So think about, don't think about conquering the world, think about building on success. That's the nature of innovation, right? And, and adapt. So find out what your addressable market is. Make sure you have an outstanding, that you deliver an outstanding experience that is easy to implement, that is scalable, that is affordable, and build on that. Because if you're, if you, what you do is really valuable, you will pull people toward a future practice that will benefit kids. So if you get stuck in where the hockey puck is right now, you're going to build for old paradigms, old school models, with all of the, um, drawbacks that we're trying to eliminate in education. I encourage you to be bold and to think about where the hockey puck is going. And, and, but it is tricky because, you know, unless you have unlimited funding, you're going to have to figure out a way to monetize it. So for us, we took a look at the overall market. We took a look at the subset of dressable market. We went after the, the reform area so that, again, we could de-risk it for the people who didn't have 
the wherewithal or the investment or just even the, the ability to evaluate one program against another, they saw what happened with some of the innovators and they said, wow, my school is like that. My profile of child is like that. My profile of teacher is like that. I'm gonna try Dreambox too. And in a couple years, we're in every state. So, I mean, it's not that exciting, but don't, don't look for the, to, to try to conquer everything. Build on successes, and you'd be surprised what you can do with some great teachers saying great things about you in the social media. Yeah, Randy, I'm curious about McGraw-Hill and, and your work in this area, because Center for Digital Innovation has been around since 2002, if I do my, my math correctly. And um, y you must encounter with the number of students you serve an incredible variation and, and how do you plan for that? How, what advice would you have for people about that? Well, I, I guess what I would say is don't believe the false dichotomy. Don't believe that it's either going to be print or it's technology, and at some point we're all going to flip over to all being digital. Oftentimes you hear people at the state level say, oh, by 2015 we're not going to have any books anymore. Um, I don't think that's realistic. I don't think that's good for kids. I think what we'll see is some kind of transition to a point where we're going to keep on using books for certain purposes, we're going to use technology for certain purposes, we're going to figure out what is best to be used in the classroom for what type of purpose. Um, I think that, it, to, specifically to your question, um, schools are all over the place. Um, some schools, and you'd be, you know, it's not always the low income neighborhood schools that don't have the computer. Sometimes they have a very high level of, uh, of student uh, computer, computer ratio. Um, so I think that, that you need, really need to go in and target your, your customers, as, as Jesse said. I think that's, that's essential. You got to know who you're going after and um, who, what kind of problem you're trying to solve for them. The other thing I would say is um, don't, I always say don't believe your internal PR. Well, um, I also wouldn't believe the PR that comes from the top echelons of institutions, right? So um, uh, a superintendent uh, comes in, gets a bond, buys a laptop for every kid, and all of a sudden the PR goes out and that school district is a one-to-one -one district. Well, yes, they have one device for every kid maybe, but you need to go down to the building level. You need to talk to the principals, you need to talk to the teachers, and really see how that implementation is going. Because the research shows that it takes three to five years once the technology is purchased for that system to stabilize and for there to be a comfort level on the students and on the teachers' part to get used to how that one-to-one -one, um, implementation goes. And at that point, the technology is outdated and they buy more, so that works out well. I want to open this up for questions also, too, so, so think about some things, but I want to ask everybody here uh, one quick question because I have seen this in some recent news articles, and that is the question is, does technology even belong in the classroom? And I've seen some stories sort of questioning about its efficacy and, and, and the use of technology in the classroom. Does technology belong in the classroom? And what do you say to somebody who questions its role? Can, can I answer? I, I'd like to add one more piece on to the last sure. bit about what, what is in the classroom. Because I think um, we sometimes get stuck in thinking about that, like, if every child has a laptop that that, and, and it kind of answers your new question too, that, that if every child has their own laptop, or their own iPad, or their own whatever, that that's kind of the ideal situation, and that that's the ideal situation for the entrepreneur as well, um, because if the holy grail is reaching the kid, then that's the best way to make a difference in education. But I don't think that's necessarily either the, the only or the best way to, for technology to make a difference in education. Um, I think all three of us are pretty kid focused in our our delivery of needs, but there's also the focus on like helping teachers, and so that that one teacher computer in the classroom, the teachers need professional development, and so there's a huge opportunity for technology to help teachers connect with and teach each other. Teachers need to be able to track um, data for their students, and so there's a huge opportunity for technology to help teachers in all these different ways to help principals 
principles in all these different ways. And so when I say I, I, there are lots and lots of schools where the kids don't have their own computers and, and maybe there's only one teacher computer, there are still enormous opportunities for technology to help improve learning outcomes for kids in that school, maybe not through directly reaching the kid, but through helping the teacher do his or her job better. Okay. So let me poll the audience, actually. I have two questions, and you get to pick, it, pick which one I ask, okay? <laughs> so the, the, the first question is, what about this continued debate about whether technology belongs in the classroom? That's question one. Question two is, does everything have to be priced as free in education? So who wants to hear the first one about does technology begin long in the classroom? Okay, who wants to hear the second question? So let me ask you, does everything have to be, does everything have to be free? I mean, because there's a, this big movement about uh, free trial, freemium, uh, open education resources. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the, the commercial folks here on this first. But I'm, I'm curious, what kind of pressure does that put on you? Does it put on entrepreneurs? Does it put on the industry as a whole? Randy, do you want to take that first? Well, yeah, I, don't, I think that it's, it's an unsustainable uh, uh, marketplace if everything's free. I think that you need to be able to ha get, uh, get funding coming back to the people that are building the product so that they can reinvest in the product. I think that's especially true in a ASP model where you have subscriptions on an, on an annual basis where it's up to the product developer to make sure that the customer's happy with the product so that they stick with it, um, which is a very, currently a very difficult thing for a school district to maintain and to budget for. Um, so I, th I think there is a place for free. Um, there's a place, place for freemium. Um, I think there's some very interesting things going on with uh, providing free uh, applications to teachers um, and then having um, other entities pay for those if they're adopted. So there's some interesting uh, different business models. But I do think at some point you need, uh, you need the investment to come back to the, the developers of the product if you want a sustainable system. Jesse, do you have any thoughts? So how many of you all have a Dropbox account? How many of you pay for it? Okay. So I, I, th I think that... Um, if your box is bad, free is irrelevant. But if your box is good, and all you folks who would never have tried Dropbox, who try Dropbox, now experience Dropbox, now you are part of the addressable market for that company. So I think that um, models are school models are changing, and I think approaches to the market are changing as well. And I actually like uh, a freemium model to de-risk a move from what you are currently doing to de-risk a move to innovation, to de-risk a move to try something new. But I think it has to be good enough that it has some staying power. So I started out with my free Dropbox and now I'm, I'm paying. You're, you know, I ran out of room and I'm, I'm paying. So we all have our, our but, but the reason why I'm paying is because I had a good experience. Um, on, on Dropbox. So many people here might have experienced uh, Salesforce.com uh, for free. And, and now you're part of organizations that pay subscriptions to, to, to Salesforce.com. So I think access to your potential buyer is, is priceless. And if you think of it as a marketing expense, you know, a lot of people spend 500, 500, up to $500 to try to acquire a new customer. If you think about freemium in that context, it's a marketing expenditure. So I think it depends. If you have a bad box, free isn't gonna help you. But if you have a good box that otherwise people are not gonna experience, then freemium might be a, an excellent way to fund marketing and market penetration, early market penetration. Lindsay, I'm curious on your perspective. Do you use free products? I mean, you use Skype. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, and and what, what's your take and what's when you've been working with startup communities like at Startup um, Weekends, Seattle EDU, mm -hmm. what's the take on free? Is everybody focused on it? I mean, I think, like, the freemium model has almost kind of become necessary. Like, everything that you buy, every a widget that you buy on your iPhone, like there's the free one, and then if you love it, then you go pay for the upgraded version of Plants vs. Zombies. And the, um, if, 
The educational value of that is quite high, by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> My five-year-old loves it. Um, but the, if you, the teachers need to have an opportunity to see it. They need to have an opportunity to try it out and decide that it's worthwhile. And like, um, like you were saying, if you have one teacher in a school who tries something out and says, this is really valuable in my classroom, he or she can go to their principal and say, we should buy a school-wide account for this. And we have, um, I mean, every week or two, someone in my school sends around an email saying, hey, you guys, I just tried this out. Go try it out and let's decide if we want to buy a school-wide subscription. But it's really true. It's every week or two. And we don't buy them all. It's, it's kind of overwhelming how much there is out there and how much of it like one teacher really, really likes and then none of the other teachers end up liking it. And so that's a big part too, is figuring out how like, if there's only one or two teachers in a school who want your product, but there's how many schools in the country? About 100,000. 100, About 100,000 schools in the country. One or two teachers in every school, that's not bad. Um, but you don't want to be giving all of those for free. So I don't really know what the right model is for that, but it's, I think it is fine if, if something works really well for some teachers but not for other teachers, but then how do you monetize if it's not a whole school buying it? Can I just add to that? Um, there's also a way to conceptualize the, or categorize curriculum products into core products um, and supplemental products. Core products will generally be adopted across a district, provide consistency, Supplemental products are the ones that are added on on top of, and they give you probably more flexibility in uh, having one or two teachers adopt a cr and, and not necessarily being all of the teachers in all of the districts. And so um, that, those supplemental products give you a lot of um, flexibility in how you go to market, whereas the core products, at least up to date, have been more of a traditional adoption approach uh, to the market. Now, you said at least up to date, and that was actually going to be what I was going to ask about. Isn't this the digital chunking of content sort of creating a fuzzier line between what's considered core and what's considered supplemental? Um, I think that's a question that's out there. Um, I think that there's, there's consideration about it, um, consistency in pedagogy, consistency in instructional design um, for uh, core content that needs to be considered. Um, uh, I think uh, if you go and you just think about an iTunes model of um, instructional materials that you could easily take away and, and be very um, chaotic in your instructional design and that could cause problems in the learning of the kids. Um, but I think it's a question that's still, that's still out there. Right, because Jesse, because Dreambox can be used either way, correct? It can. Um, so we actually have, so we, we position ourselves as a supplementary K through five adaptive mathematics uh, product. But we have districts that have um, dispensed with books. They're on the, that end of the technology ado adoption curve. And they've adopted it as a core offering. It's not what we have positioned it, but they have found that their results with their kids are so much better than what they had with their previous core program that they're willing to innovate because they have the data that suggests that it's not very risky. But I just wanted to add one, there's a danger to free, which I just wanted to just get on your, your radar screen, which is, so I, I, I had the opportunity to talk with um, the former CEO of Salesforce.com about free. I wanted to know what was so great about it. Uh, because you as entrepreneurs are going to have to go out and get funding, right? You're going to have to convince your investors to continue to give you funding, and they're going to want to see a sustainable business model that can scale, right? Putting free aside. And so the danger that he highlighted was if you have a great freemium model, if you are able to monetize 1% to 2% of all the responders, consider yourself lucky. And the best advice I got from him was, so that 98%, you remember everybody who had the Dropbox, right? And then there were like five people over here who actually paid for it. The big danger is that you spend untold resources and time and incur unbelievable opportunity costs chasing after all you guys, you know, you freeloaders <laughs> who don't want to pay. 
And as an entrepreneur, you have to be very, very disciplined to understand who the freeloaders are and like them for the marketing and for the word of mouth and everything, but to really focus your attention as a business on the few folks who are willing to pay and to have the data systems and the business systems that will help you identify those. So there's an underbelly to free. You can do free, 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 and then you get out of your funding, you go out for another round, and they say, how are we gonna monitor? Well, it's look how many free I have. So that's one danger. The second danger is that they make sure that the people who are responding have purse. So in our first version of freemium, we went out to teachers because we, we love teachers. So teachers don't have much money, right? So we had unbelievable response rates, but we don't have, we didn't, right? They don't have much money. So they, they wanted to buy, they love Dreambox. They couldn't imagine Dreambox being pulled out of their classroom, but they couldn't ante up, right? So the next version of the freemium had a more collaborative uh, model where we still went to the teachers who are so knowledgeable about curriculum and about classroom management, et cetera, but we asked them to introduce us to their principal if they liked it. And so for us, again, it gets back to having a good box. So it's not risky for a teacher who feels like they have something that's really working for her kids to go to the principal and say, maybe we should put this in all of our classrooms. But if it's not a good box, that teacher is not gonna do that. And so the next version of it had like a two-step, which I never would have done in the first version because I thought you know, if we add that step, it's gonna de decrease response. And the wisdom of this gentleman was that if it decreases response among people that you're never gonna monetize, it's a marketing expense. Figure out a way to get that um, to, to people who actually have purse. So the, it, freemium, is, freemium is important, but those are two risks, so I share that with you. Pay it forward. The third risk, by the way, is one that foundations can deal with too. And uh, Ash, are you there? We have a question over here, so or a question or comment. So keep your hand up so we can get the microphone to you. Thank you. But uh, the third one is, is very important too, is if people can't figure out how you as an organization are making money because you're giving something away free and it's not obvious how you're making money, you may actually keep people from putting anything sensitive or important of their data in your product because they can't count on you being around long enough to either use it or get it back out. And that's actually happened a couple times in educational technology startups. One very well-known, uh, highly publicized one recently, the company didn't go under, they pivoted which meant that they figured out they should be doing something else. And they had an education platform that they had sold to a number of schools, that schools had put data into, that they were no longer gonna support. So free is dangerous. Make sure people know that you have figured out how to make money and you're not doing this out of the goodness of your heart with happy fluffy bunnies coming down from the unicorn planet to help you out. Yes. Uh, speaking of free, um, the other side of products is of course services. And when Red Hat first came in, those of us that had affection for Microsoft, which is a diminishing number, but anyway, um, were really freaked out because Red Hat was free. But it never really hurt the business. Red Hat makes 40% of their revenues from training. So the services that surround free are a revenue stream. The second thing is the other business model, I'm at, uh, Tyson Greer from Ambient Insight, the other business model that we've been seeing a lot of, and McGraw-Hill knows about this, of course, because they're doing it, is selling to parents, direct to parents. And particularly with supplemental products. Um, a kid has a textbook in school, the parents get sold the online version of that. And it's a wonderful new market that we're seeing a lot of. Well, I'd like to be doing a lot more of that, but yeah. <laughs> Um, I think professional development is a huge opportunity, a huge need, um, and it's a it's a pretty um, s you know a lot of small players in the in the in the area. So I think that's uh, that idea of providing a free um, product and providing services around that's an interesting an interesting business model that that may take off a little bit more. We have some more questions, um, gentlemen. Can I throw in one thing to, to Tyson's comment as well, though, that um, you know she was mentioning having uh, training as like a, a side thing that someone can purchase for a particular product. There's also room for training to be the product itself. Um, I, I want to make sure that we don't 
really keep all of our focus on content-based ideas for entrepreneur entrepreneurial endeavors. There's all this other room besides just content delivery. Training in and of itself can be a great um, area to look into if you want to reach teachers. Um, so there's a, there's a lot more than just the content for us to be thinking about. Let me add to that because I, so the thing that I'd like to, that you may be able to add to as well, um, we've been talking about curriculum a lot, but there's, I think there's opportunities now with um, the importance of data um, for uh, technology companies to come in and help school districts manage their data, analyze their data, visualize their data, um, these, this is not something that school districts are used to doing, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit very hard and very fast at both the state level and at the district level. The, um, the new uh, LMS systems that have come in and have taken um, millions and millions of, uh, of users very quickly have ramped up faster than I ever would have expected. Yeah, like uh, Moodle, Moodle Rooms. Uh, LMS is Learning Management System. It's basically plumbing to deliver instructional materials between an educator and students. They got their start pretty much in higher education. Blackboard is probably the most both well-known and reviled name in, uh, in LMS because of its early difficulty of use in the early, that's the nicest way I can phrase that. Uh, but you have Canvas, you have a number of others now in this space as well. Uh, school, and you have Edmodo and Schoology, Schoology at, uh, at sort of the freemium model level as well. So, I mean, one way to think about uh, technology and, and is, is in professional development, which essentially is a fancy way of saying continuing education in the education market. You also have the back office operations, student information systems, grade books, uh, procurement systems, all that's another area that a student or teacher, teacher may touch, student won't touch. You have curriculum, which can be digital content, which we've talked about a fair amount here, and you have tests. And even though tests are hated, they are still necessary. And because we're talking not just about high stakes tests, but also um, embedded assessments inside of curriculum. We're talking about what's called formative assessment, which is uh, understanding what a student is doing day to day. So all these areas technology touches. And, and the reason I know so much about this is I used to be senior vice president of marketing at Pearson Education for four years. So I have a small idea of how this all works in the US. So other questions, yes. Uh, my question uh, to the panel is, uh, what do you think of disruptive uh, grassroots distribution channels like TeachersPayTeachers.com, which has came out of nowhere and is making a lot of noise and, and apparently a lot of revenue for teachers. Uh, I mean, that's that's wasn't expected. What do you think? So I think that um, there are a lot of viable channels, and I think the challenge for an entrepreneur is to figure out where to focus your resources because you could have a very balkanized effort that will diminish your overall impact if you spread yourself too thin. So We Are Teachers has been around for a long time. It's a similar one. So you just have to figure out what works best for your strategy, for your target audience, and figure out a way to make sure you have some concentration of your uh, resources so that you can have the impact and, and get to achieve some level of predictability about that impact. And once you get larger and you can scale, then I think you can add more diverse diversity of, of channels. But I think one of the risks um, that uh, early entrepreneurs often make is they spread themselves too thin. Uh, when, when I came to Dreambox, it was really a consumer proposition because we were focused on parents who happened to be teachers or administrators. Um, and that was very helpful. But when I came in, we really focused our, uh, our, our time and resources on schools. We didn't shut down the consumer, but um, we have been able to build a very robust foundation because we were able to, frankly, double down our investment because of the focus. And so your, your challenge as entrepreneurs isn't going to be to identify the bad ideas and to kill them. It's to cull through all the great ideas and figure out which ones are the best. Also, I point out Teachers Pay Teachers was just basically creating a large marketplace for something educators have always done, which is share lesson plans. And uh, it, 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 it really basically was an issue of scaling something that was always very manual or hard to do. Other questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, I had a kind of user-centered design question, if you will. And that is, we asked earlier what assumptions to make about the classrooms. And I wanted to ask the corollary of what assumptions should we make about the students? 
And specifically what I mean is, if you think about what students see in the wild, and the whole notion of consumer internet, gaming, telecommunications, ubiquitous access, all of these things are things they see when they leave the classroom, and that must have implications for what assumptions we should make about what they should see in the classroom. And so what are the considerations associated with that? That is what we call the consumerization of ed tech. I know, I know I've written about it. Uh, Randy, what have you seen? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think that this generation of kids um, has an expectation, and oftentimes they're asked to shut down when they go into a classroom, a traditional classroom. Um, I think their expectation is uh, very different than what the teachers are oftentimes. Um, I mean, uh, they'll go in, they'll start writing, uh, creative writing on Tumblr, and then they'll go in and, and have to uh, a answer questions in English class and you know, you ask them, why aren't you writing? And well, you don't, the, the, the answer to that question, I actually asked this question of a 10th grader and she said, well, we don't create in school, we create in Tumblr. So yeah, I think there's, I think there's a lot of opportunities to take the kinds of tools that they use outside the classroom and embed those in what um, the kinds of project-based learning and creative work that um, s reform, uh, school reform has been trying to do for a long time, has been doing for a long time. So we can pull in outside tools, we don't have to recreate brand new tools, but we have to allow, um, uh, we have to free up the system to, to use those tools. Um, and, and I think there's some opportunities. I think that's part of what I, we're seeing as a tipping point now, and, and it's a very exciting time. Evernote is a great example of a product that's used broadly, but also now has got a strong focus on education because it was so widely adopted by teachers independently. Yeah, you're seeing Google Docs being used very widely as well now. And Google has an, application, has an education branch now too. I feel I, mean, I think I was confused by your question at first because I think I think you're really asking a, a pedagogy question and not a tech and not an edu not a technology question and so I think that's more about like how are how do teachers reach the kids where they are and and that's a question that teachers are asking themselves all the time and I love having technology entrepreneurs asking that question too um, because we're we're really looking at how do we reach the kids um, and just having them take the exact same assignment you would have given and having them do it on tumblr instead isn't changing education. It's, it's how are the kids really thinking and how can we support them in their growth from where they are. Another question up here. So today you focused a lot on how entrepreneurs can target educators and teachers, uh, the, the folks that are in the classroom, but what role do you feel parents play in that and how do you see them becoming advocates for the use of beneficial technology in the classroom? And you know, you, you hear a lot about parents kind of taking the education of their children in their own hands. Have you seen that? And how do entrepreneurs work with parents in order to, um, to get those technologies into the classroom as well? Jesse, do you have any thoughts on that? So I think parents are a very important force in um, the rapid adoption of blended learning, you know, combining face-to-face -face classroom experience with instructional technologies. I think that uh, parents are very powerful, PTO organizations, and just frankly because of changed expectations. So Lindsay was talking about 21st century learning. I mean, parents want to make sure that their kids are, are not just going to survive the next century, but they're going to drive it. They're going to thrive in it. And so parents want to make sure that their kids are prepared for the world that they're going to inherit. And oftentimes, we, our, tech, our technology initiatives were focused on middle school and high school. Even, you know, Gates, when they first came out, were, were focused on, on older kids. Well, when you go into an electronics store and you see a three-year-old going up and touching TVs, TV screens, and, and wondering why they're all broken <laughs> because they don't respond to her touch, that child is, is going to have a different expectation and not when she's in middle school, when she's in elementary school. And parents see this every day. And I think that the, one, of the promise, one, one of the great promises of blended learning 
is that it really can help to close the gap between the way kids are living and the way they're learning. And so I think that we just have to get over this, is technology coming or not? If you ask a kid how to use technology, they'll look at you like you have four heads. It's not about technology, it's how do you communicate? How do you stay in touch? How do you, it's, it's just embedded. This whole notion about e-learning is gonna be obsolete. It's just gonna be learning that's embedded with technology. So we are imposing our own limitations when we, when we think about this, and children don't think this way. Children are ready for a different world and they're ready for different experiences. They're ready for instantaneous, on, you know, uh, on their touch response to their life and they should have that in their learning. And if we do that, then we're gonna prepare kids that are gonna be critical thinkers and they're gonna be ready to drive the 21st century. They're gonna take care of us when we get adulpated. I would also point out there's an issue with parents getting more involved and that is that many parents don't actually even know what's happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is because some parents just don't have the time or don't want to make the time. The other part is it's harder over the last 40 years for a parent to get into a classroom where education is going on, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because of a number of security concerns and other issues. Also the fact that after fifth grade, the child wants nothing to do with you at school. <laughs> I, I agree with that, but I would also, <laughs> having teenage daughters, I would agree with that. But I would also say that we have to do a better job of providing parents with information about how the kid is doing. Um, about their homework assignments, about their grades, so that the parents can be involved and ask the right questions, that's gonna get them involved and, 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 and make that a full circle. Can I just build on that? So one of the things we did early on at Dreambox was we pushed out communications to parents and we said, guess what Grace did today on Dreambox? Grace did this and that, and what you could do with Grace tonight at the dinner table is this, this, and the other thing. And so we, we enrolled parents, and it didn't really matter if the parents had a great education or not. And what we found was that parents would come in with their reports from Dreambox, and they would sit down with their teacher, and they would say, tell me why this circle is green and why this circle is red. They didn't really know, but they were par actively participating in their child's learning. And I think one of the great opportunities in, in the, with technology and learning is that we're gonna be able to leverage formally um, non-learning time. You know, time outside the classroom. Let's connect it. And if we have cloud-based technologies, all learning guardians, parents, teachers, administrators can see immediately, instantaneously, and dynamically what is going on with Grace, Grace's cohorts, her whole classroom, her whole school, her whole district. And there's and this separation between consumer and institutional, formal learning and informal learning is gonna go away. Learning is gonna happen all the time. The question is, is it going to be shepherded and is it going to be structured in a way that's going to promote student progression as quickly as we want it? Let me get to another question over here. This gentleman, you did have it. You still have a question? Okay, we, we have it. You're still awake? Can, this, can we get that gentleman over there in the... Uh... Oh, okay, great. I'm sorry. Maroon sweaters after that. All right. Hey, I, th I think it was, um, I don't know if I've got the names right. It was Lindsay mentioned something about innate technology that could enable uh, the, the teacher's ability to actually do a better job of teaching and that got me thinking about where's the student's attention during this. I've got a six-year-old son and I know he, play, he plays Dreambox and when he's doing that, he loves it, and, and when he's doing that he's totally focused on kind of this thing by himself unless he needs help from me. In the classroom though, I think he likes to have interactions with the teachers and with, with his friends. So, so as opportunities for technologists, should they be focused on things that bring the child's attention to the screen only? And, or should they be focused on things that allow the teacher to provide a richer presentation to the students? And actually just your, your thought got me thinking that maybe the latter is actually a, a richer field right now, I don't know. I think so. I, I think the latter is more valuable. I mean, I, I teach middle school. I teach seventh graders. And there are fields, that there are um, areas of thought that say we should just blow off content entirely in middle school and just help them develop social skills and, and those kinds of things. I mean, middle, <laughs> middle schoolers and, and all children need connections and and so when when stuff started shifting to like the fully flipped model of kids go home and watch um, video delivered lectures and then they come back to school and do worksheets about the lectures there's I mean 
I'm sorry, you can tell my opinion of flipped teaching by how I just described it. That's not really how people who love flipped teaching would describe it. There are beautiful ways of describing it. But there's been this big backlash against flipped teaching recently because the connection, the personal human connection between the, to the teacher and the student is so important to helping the kids develop all those social skills. Like, I, yeah, I teach science, but I teach children. And, and those children are learning science in my classroom, but they're also learning so many other important things. And so I, I don't want to just give them games to play. I, I want to give them games to play. Games are fun. But I also want to give them learning opportunities that just take place in my classroom. And I want to give them learning opportunities that are just you know, all kinds of different learning opportunities. And so if, if I also want support in that. And so the technology can support me and being able to track my students' learning. It can support me in making sure I'm communicating effectively with parents. There's all these other ways that technology can support me in providing a richer, more personalized learning environment for my students um, besides steering them towards the screen. So the latter, probably, I think, was the way that what she's saying. Um, <laughs> my first answer was yes. <laughs> and I, I, I think one of the persistent myths about technology is that technology is designed to replace teachers. That's one of the persistent myths about technology and education. And the reality is it allows a teacher to do what a teacher does really well, even better, and allows students to do small group learning, get some individualized help when they need it, but they all still come back together and work with the teacher. Yeah, most blended so blended models are not 100% um, screen, and the teacher goes on a coffee break. You know, it's it's a it's a ro tip, tip, typically it's a rotational model. So imagine a classroom where a teacher. So the average classroom size is what 25 uh, kids, and that's up from 16 in 1980. So teachers are seeing huge increases in the number of kids, and so in how is that teacher, even the best teacher? going to give personalized learning to every kid in that classroom. Well, if you have a rotational model and you spend a third of your time on uh, an education technology, then instead of a teacher having to, to teach to a really wide breadth of learners, because the classrooms are getting larger, but they're also getting more diverse in terms of learning readiness, let's say, then in that rotational model, the teacher can narrowly deliver her live instruction knowing with confidence that the kids who, are, are, who do have screen time are getting what they need when they need it in a very complimentary way to what's going on in her live session. So we have to expand our notion of what blended learning is. It's not a substitute for what's happening in the live classroom. It's a complement for what's happening. So it allows the great teachers to do what they do better, to get All back right. to the art of teaching. We have time for two more questions, I think, and the very other patient gentleman over here. Thank you. So um, I'm a person who has to hire a lot of technologists. You're what? I'm can, a person who has to hire a lot of technologists, and I know it's very, very, very hard because um, great programmers are in great demand. So especially if you think about all these companies that are opening up in Seattle. So this is probably a question for uh, folks who have been hiring technologists for more than 10 years, right? Has this recent kind of ed tech bubble helped you hire great programmers? Or are those guys just getting lapped up by Facebook and Twitter and Google and Amazon and me and other people? What has been the change that you've seen in the last 10 years? Is ed tech sexy? Do people want to work at ed, in ed tech companies now? We have some outstanding um, engineers at Dreambox, and we frankly pull from places like um, Amazon and Valve and other places because they w they care about doing well and doing good, and they want to uh, apply their technical prowess to something that they care very passionately about. And many of them, frankly, have kids in elementary school and are witnessing what is happening, what should be happening that's not happening, so we really haven't had, I mean, it's, it's a competitive market, but we are, we're looking for a, a special uh, kind of engineer. And we, this has been a really great place for us. It's gotten better. You know why it's gotten better? It's gotten better for a couple of reasons. One is that you have a lot of, very, a lot of smart money. So Reed Hastings is an investor in Dreambox, and John Doerr is an inv investor in Dreambox. And so that means something to a lot of uh, savvy uh, te technologists. Okay, so there's smart money coming. And 
there is, uh, when they see the results of what it is um, and, and the possibilities, they also know it's a special time in education technology because of the economic tsunami that we've been in. There are a lot of people who would never have thought about some of these technologies. They, they, would, they used to consider it a nice to have. Now it's a must have because they're seeing 55% increases in their class size in two years. And so what used to be a nice to have is a must have. So the economic kind of uh, drama, the change expectations that we were talking about on part of both kids and parents, and the emergence of these nimble technologies that can literally impact learning real time at the point of instruction are pulling the best minds and the best talent because they think they're going to change the world. And I agree. Randy, how about you? You've been doing this for 10 years. Yeah, I think, first of all, Seattle is a tremendous place. I think the competition has gotten um, stronger and, and higher. I think we use the same technologies that, that Google does. We have actually very close, one of the Google uh, offices is very close to us. Um, but we also are able to draw people from there and the same from the same pool. Um, just like Jesse said, we, we hire people who have fire in their belly to build products that are going to make a difference in the lives of kids. And um, also for people who want to have their work uh, be shared with people from that are diverse. So we work in um, agile teams, and a part of those teams are former teachers, our instructional designers, our artists, and so they get a chance, the engineers themselves get a chance to um, have their ideas shared with all these people from different walks of life and who have different backgrounds. And I think it's a very exciting environment for them to work in. All right, one more question over here, and then I'm gonna have a closing question for our panel. I thought I would accept the assignment of asking the superficial question about charter schools since that's in the news this week. I think there's an idea among a lot of lay people who are not in this room that you would get your uh, fastest and strongest traction in independent schools like Lindsay's and in charter schools and that traditional publics would tend to be uh, very glacial or resistant or even hopeless. And my question is, is there a valid market segmentation on the spectrum of independent to charter to traditionals or is, that, or is that, in fact, not a particularly relevant segmentation when you're looking at your market opportunities? So I would say that um, I would focus on leaders, regardless of what setting that they're in. Because you're going to have some charter schools that, are gonna, they're, that aren't going to have a technology strategy. Technology is going to be, frankly, anathema to their approach. You're going to have... Um, some of the most challenging public schools uh, that are under-resourced, that have maybe not the best teacher core, but have a, a leader who is an innovator, who is determined to make an investment in technology because of the impact that, that they think it can have. So I think that you really, this is about market segmentation, and it's about really understanding your buyer. And I think that, so for, for Dreambox, we have as many people who are charters, who are not charters. We have independents, we have Catholics, we have really, you know, tough, you know, urban settings, and we have, you know, really affluent settings. You know, here in Seattle, we're in West, West Seattle Elementary and in Queen Anne, because this adaptive technology works wherever, as long as there is a leader that has a vision around blended learning and blended schooling. So I, I don't think that there is one um, model that works better. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that's a, a dichotomy that I would look at. Um, uh, I think the leadership is is the key, I and mean, we know that from research as well. Is in uh, educational reform, leadership is the key, and I think from a technology perspective, leadership is key because it's about the fidelity of implementation for the program that that you're uh, that you're trying to put into the classroom. The only difference that I, I might expect if you were addressing independent school, I, I completely agree with what these guys are saying, is it's, it's about who the leaders are in any given building. The only difference I might expect to see would be, um, um, what's that word for how embedded something gets into an institution? Ossified. <laughs> Penetration. Penetration, yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, for, for how much you could penetrate into a school. In an independent school, you might have one teacher who buys your product and starts using it, and then three teachers, and then five teachers, and then seven teachers. In, in a 
public school, depending on the structure, you might have that one leader teacher who takes it, but then the next step after that one leader teacher has to be the entire school. Um, so that, that might be the only difference that you might expect if it, but e even in the independent schools, it depends on how that independent school is run. It depends on how that charter school is run. Um, but I think you, you more often see individual teachers having that level of freedom. I say that when I was in Chicago teaching in public school, I had an enormous amount of freedom, but it wasn't the kind of like, you go do what's awesome kind of freedom. It was, oh, who's that first year teacher down the hall kind of freedom. <laughs> You know? All right, so final bit of advice for the folks in the audience. If you were getting into digital education today, what one thing do you wish, what one mistake do you wish that you had not made or one bit of information that you had if you were starting fresh today, what would you bring forward? What would that one piece of information be or one piece of advice? Or asked another way in a more coherent method. <laughs> What's the one big mistake you don't want to see everybody in this audience making if they're going into digital education? What one thing do, don't they know about education they should that we haven't covered? Uh, one thing that I find myself thinking a lot about is, is just innovation. I don't know if we, I mentioned this earlier. If you come out of the gate with the belief that you're gonna get it right the first time, you really might be disappointed. I mean, Maybe. I, I think that, you know, so I remember when I was uh, talking to Reed Hastings about this opportunity and I said, you know, you don't want me to come run, run this company. I have, I've made every possible mistake there is to make in the past 15 years in K through 12. In fact, I keep my basket of, of all my mistakes really close to me. You know, find somebody who has a smaller basket and he's like, you know, you're perfect for this. And so I, I think that it takes some pressure off yourself to build on success, but don't be afraid to innovate and experience disappointments because that's where you learn so much. And as long as you stay very close to your end user kids, and if you always keep great instruction at the apex of your concern, then I think you can get through those periods where you make mistakes and you fall short because you will find that you will emerge and, and be strengthened by that, by that experience. Randy? Um, I think that's great advice. I think the, make sure you're, you're focusing on making a difference in the lives of kids um, and then that you're, you're really having an effective difference in their learning and focusing on whatever pedagogical issue you're, you're trying to affect change on. And um, in doing that, keep a focus and a conversation going with the teachers that are using your products and with the kids that are using your products. And Lindsay, any advice? Um, the, keep in mind that if you want to reach education, if you want to make a difference in, in kids' lives, your end user doesn't have to be a kid. Teachers need support in, in technology just as much as the kids do, if not possibly more so. We have so many things that we need to keep track of and so much sharing of knowledge that we need to do. And, and there's great opportunities for direct learning support for kids. There's also enormous need and great opportunities for indirect learning support for kids through supporting either individual teachers, whole buildings full of teachers, whole districts in their administration. There's so many different levels of our needs. Don't just think you have to go directly for the kids. All right, great. Let me thank Lindsay, Jesse, and Randy, and thank you very much. And does anybody from MIT Enterprise Forum want to say what the next program is or have any closing thoughts? Sam? <laughs> well, thanks a lot to the panel and the moderator flank. It was a great program. Uh, please uh, join us for our next event, which is the, which is the January 10th VLAB. And our next forum event is going to be on January 16th on Big Data. Uh, thanks again, and uh, have a great night. <laughs> <laughs>